Hi, welcome to my channel. My name is Naomi, and let's dream about beauty. In today's video, I'm going to be doing a get ready with me story time where I am talking about my issues with depression and anxiety and a hospitalization that I had about a year and a bit ago. Uh, if this is something that you're interested in watching and hearing my story, then please stay tuned. A warning, this video does contain triggers surrounding um, mental health, mental illness. So if this is something that you're especially sensitive to, then I suggest that you click away. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about the makeup and a little bit about my story. So I'm going in with the primer, Milk Hydro Grip Primer. This is relatively new to me. I've had it for maybe a week. So, um, as I have mentioned in a previous video, I suffer from uh, anxiety number one and depression number two. And uh, it's in my 40s, it's been worse than it has been my whole life. Although um, I never used to know to call what I was feeling anxiety. I didn't know that's what it was, but I know that I've always been somebody who overanalyzes every situation, overthinks everything, takes things very personally, worries a lot, and tends to overreact. The reason why I am sharing this story, and it's a difficult one for me to talk about, is because I uh, have a lot of shame. And I've developed, you know, a lot of friendships on YouTube, and um, I think that according to, if you've read anything by um, Brené Brown, she talks about shame has been sort of the guiding um, concept of her research, how to deal with shame. And she says, you know, talking to people about your shame and them responding with empathy. And I know that most of the people who hear this story will respond with empathy. I'm afraid of judgment as well. But I don't think you can live your life being afraid of being judged. You have to open yourself up and be vulnerable. So, anyways. Um, my oldest son, my oldest son, I have stepchildren too, but mine is, he's 20 now. And he went through a difficult time when he was 18 and 19. Um, he lost his way a little bit and ended up in living in the basement, playing video games and really having a hard time launching his life. And I struggled with it too because I was afraid of tough love. I was afraid of um, pushing him too hard and it resulting in him um, reacting with emotion and anger towards me rather than thinking about what he really wanted to do. And so, did I enable him? Absolutely, I did enable him. And I, you know, I had never really been through that before. Um, parenting teenagers is very difficult. And my husband had a very difficult time dealing with it as well because he could see that I was not making the best choices for my son and that I was enabling him and he felt that um, my husband felt that my son should be pushed 
you know, baby bird out the nest type of idea. And I was very, very, very hesitant to do that. So it caused a lot of conflict and a lot of tension between my husband and myself, between my husband and my son, between me and my son, and it was a problem. And it went on for about six months. And when you compound this problem that existed, I mean, somebody who had, didn't, doesn't have any mental disabilities probably would have had a hard time coping with it as well. When you take somebody who has anxiety, who sees normal life difficulties as life or death situations, uh, it became unbearable. And one evening, um, my husband and my son got into an argument and I was in my room and I had medication called Ativan, which is a uh, lorazepam. So it's a little bit similar to Valium in that it's supposed to be a sedative, it's calming. And I took one and um, five minutes later I took another one because the first one didn't work and I was, I was freaking out and in a lot of emotional pain and I just wanted the pain to stop and I was not in my right mind I wasn't making good I was not making good decisions and so I took the second out of N and then I think I remember taking a third pill I don't remember when it was, but I don't remember anything after that. I forgot to grab powder, so I will just be right back. Uh, so, I have very faint memories of the night. I don't, there's a lot of blanks, a lot of things that I don't remember. So a lot of what I'm going to tell you next comes from uh, my husband telling me what happened. But I apparently consumed the entire bottle of Ativan and at one point I fell in my room and my husband heard me fall and he came in and he and my son took me to the hospital and I was in emergency. I was admitted straight away. They had me drink charcoal, I don't remember that. I remember the car ride a little bit. I don't remember being admitted, I don't really remember being at the hospital. Um, but instead of listening to me and listening to what was going on, they reacted like I was a drug addict, that I was addicted to Ativan. And at one point, I, I think I just you know, I slept a lot, but at one point they were concerned because my heart rate was quite high. And the doctor who was uh, taking care of my case um, assumed that I was addicted to Ativan and that I was having withdrawal symptoms and that that's why my heart rate wouldn't go down. So she gave me more Ativan to try to bring my heart rate down. Um, between my husband and the doctor, they agreed that I should stay in overnight 
to be observed and my husband left and in that time I guess the doctor came in and started talking to me and I don't know what I said but I was still in a lot of pain emotionally I don't think I was rational I don't think I was in my right mind and I, I have no idea what was said but I do know also that at some point I phoned my husband and I cried and I said please come back and get me I don't want to stay here so he came back and in that time the doctor made me a formal patient and that means that I wasn't allowed to leave. So she told my husband that I wasn't allowed to leave and he would have to leave without me. And I don't, I don't remember any of this. <sighs> so I woke up and I think it was about five o'clock in the morning and I had no idea where I was. Absolutely none. And the part that really, really angers me is that you would think that people who are who deal with psych patients would have understood that maybe I would be completely confused, disoriented, not know where I was when I woke up. And that considering I had been made a formal patient, you would have thought that they would have done something to keep me more um, under surveillance, watching me closer. Because I woke up and I started to cry. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what was going on. I don't like what this sponge is doing. I think it's time to throw it out. Uh, I'm just going to go in with a powder brush. I'm just using the Too Faced Peach Perfect powder. I've got some dryness to my skin uh, just under my eyes, but I think that's from my retinol, which still sometimes makes me feel very appealing. So, okay. Mmm, the powder tastes good, actually. So anyhow, I, so yeah, I woke up and I had, I had no idea where I was and I just cried and I started texting people because I did have my phone and I had my iPad with me and I texted my daughter and I had thought at that point that my husband had actually put me in the hospital. I didn't know. Um, I assumed I was in a hospital, but I also didn't know if I was dreaming or not. So I never stopped and thought about the consequences of texting my daughter. Like she was at her dad's house and I'm texting her to tell her I'm in the hospital like that. I should never have done that. But I thought, I, I don't know. I, I remember one thing I remember very clearly was laying there staring at the ceiling trying to decide if I was dreaming or not because I honestly couldn't tell what reality was. It was very very frightening and I was just left alone to cry by myself in a room and I could see the hallway and I could see the nurses going back and forth and I could see the nurses sitting at their station and nobody came to see if I was okay. And then a little while later when a nurse came to take my vitals 
and I'm crying and I'm asking where I am, she said, you're in the hospital. And that was basically all she would tell me because I didn't remember how I got to the hospital. Why am I here? What's going on? It's terrible. So, I think I slept some more. I don't remember. But at that point, I still didn't really know what was going on. And I made the decision to leave the hospital without shoes. And why it was that I was able to not only leave my room and get past the nurse's desk, ask for directions to the exit, I was able, as a formal patient who was supposed to be under observation, who was confused, disoriented, didn't know what was going on, I made it outside. And at that point, there were about four security guards coming on shift. And somebody said, stop her. And there was a security guard coming up behind me and four security guards in front of me. And I got tackled by five security guards. Now, I remember in a very dreamlike way this happening. I remember screaming for help. And they escorted me back into my room. I don't remember that part. And they restrained me to the bed, put on restraints. So my wrists and my ankles were tied to the bed. At that point, my phone was confiscated. So I'd had my phone with me when they tackled me, so my phone was taken away. And I was left there. And it wasn't until, so at that point, there was a shift change and the new nurse who came on was quite a bit nicer than the other nurse had been and I think she gave me more information, but my memory is still fuzzy. And at some point I asked for my phone to be brought back to me But before that, I, when I woke up, I couldn't understand why my arms hurt so much. And I looked down and I was absolutely covered in livid purple bruises all over my arms, on my wrists, um, I think on my hip. And I was confused about where I got the bruises from. I think I remembered, but I was still confused. And it wasn't until I got my phone back and I talked to my mom that I started realizing what had happened to me. And I phoned, or oh, sorry, I texted pictures of my bruises to my husband and I said, please come and help me. And he was shocked. Subsequently, so you know, he uh, went in and reviewed the security footage of the incident where they tackled me and brought me in and there was no unnecessary roughness, but I was screaming and struggling so much. And of course, I mean, I don't, I don't hold the security guards responsible. I hold the hospital staff responsible. I think that it's an absolute travesty 
that I was able to leave my room and get outside without being stopped prior. I think it's a travesty that there wasn't somebody available to explain to me what was going on. The fact that I was treated like I was a drug abuser. I mean, I did abuse Ativan, yes, that night, but I did it unknowingly in that by the time I was taking a third and fourth pill, I was already delusional. So there was no point where I was trying to get high or trying to kill myself or anything like that. But they wouldn't listen, they didn't believe anything I had to say. And maybe it's because they've dealt with so many drug addicts who are just, you know, trying to get high or trying to, who are lying, I don't really know. Um, I try to be understanding of their point of view or their position, but all I know is, is that I felt broken. Sorry. I felt broken that night and I don't feel like I've ever really been put back together again. So I do hold the hospital responsible for what happened to me. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, I wish that I'd had the courage to confront the hospital and the doctor and say, you know, why did you treat me that way? But I guess, you know, sorry, um, dealing with shame about what I did to myself and what was done to me was a difficult emotion and I just didn't feel like having any more conflict or having any more confrontations or having to try to explain myself to anybody so it was difficult so anyhow I'm just gonna grab some Kleenex and I'll be right back okay so sorry about that um, I just got a little emotional there um, so the doctor who made me a formal patient went off duty and the new doctor came on and he allowed me to go home. So I feel like this whole thing was caused by a doctor who wasn't truly listening, who judged me and made assumptions about my life. I haven't taken any Ativan. I don't use Ativan anymore. And since that night, that was the last time I have ever taken Ativan. And I would just like to reiterate that it was not a situation where I was addicted to it in any way, shape or form. And I just don't think that our society deals with depression and anxiety in any way that is truly helpful. And I, I honestly, I don't know why the hospital staff, I don't know why they were not more compassionate. I don't know why they were so judgmental. Um, bewildering to me. Anyhow, sorry that's kind of a sad story, um, but as I said I tell it for two reasons and that is I guess to try to absolve myself of the shame that I feel to share my story and somehow try to put myself back together again or fix myself so that I don't carry around this load of being ashamed of myself. And the other hope I have is that somebody somewhere who maybe has gone through something similar or who feels the same way I do about an incident or, you know, I think that when you realize that you're not the only one who's been through something like that, that you 
start to feel like, uh, you know, that you're not alone. And feeling like you're not alone is I think a hugely empowering at least it is for me so moving on to the makeup I am just not sure I'm using my shell my stash makeup in case I didn't mention that already. Kind of wanting to do a bright summery look. Maybe use. Okay, so I'm going to start out with my with my everyday palette. I'm going to use my Project Pan eyeshadow as a base. The other thing I should have done that I didn't do was I should have gone into therapy, especially after that. Then I have not. And why I haven't is um, it's not covered by our healthcare here. Um, I've been in therapy before. I didn't find it especially helpful. I guess I have some preconceived notions about therapy, but the thing is, is I know that if I found the right therapist, and I guess maybe it's just that I haven't up till now found the right person to talk to, um, and that's, you know, that's my own fault. So now I'm going to go in with this brown shade here, just through the crease. And I think my husband is much more aware now of how painful and debilitating my anxiety attacks are and he tries to be much more vigilant and much better about communicating and talking to me and talking me through my moments um, he tries to be more aware of what situations may cause problems and uh, as an example, when my son wanted to move back in because he couldn't afford a place to live, my husband knew that that would not end in a good situation. So what he said was as a compromise, he said, well, I would not really want him moving back in because that's just him moving backwards in life. So we gave my son money so that he would be able to afford his place to live and now he is living independently so you know I thought to myself that that was a good compromise between me trying to you know I wanted obviously as a mother you want to help your children and you have that strong mother bear instinct and my husband knew that I needed to help him we had to find a way to help him that satisfied both of our needs because my husband was afraid that him moving back home would result in conflict. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that, you know, there have been some positive changes since this happened just over a year ago.
but I still struggle. And I think I always will. You know, it's hard when you have a big family. There's lots of people, lots of moving parts to worry about. And I just have a habit of taking everything on myself. Um, my father, he suffered from major depressive anxiety disorder. And, you know, it kills me to know that I might have passed this down to my kids. Or that they may have, in some ways, be, you know, affected by my own problems. I hate that thought. But all I can do is the best I can do, and I can't do better than that. I do talk to my kids about, you know, mental health. And that's all I can really do. Okay, so now I'm going to go in with the Zulu palette. I'm going to go in with this shade right here, this blue shade. So that's gone in once with it dry, I'm going to spray it. This is such a pretty color. I'm so bad about slouching. And then I look down at my mirror to sit up straight. Okay, so I think I'm going to go into, back into my everyday palette. I'm just going to use this white shade here. And I'm just going to brighten up the middle. And then I'm going to take my blending brush and I'm just going to go back and forth once again.
Okay, so that's pretty much it. I just need some lipstick. Okay, so that's the finished look. I encourage you to make sure that the best thing that you can do when somebody shares a story with you that involves the anxiety, mental illness, depression, is to respond with empathy. Um, you don't really know what life is like for somebody else until you walk a mile in their shoes. And I think that as a society, we need to work together to reduce or remove the stigma that surrounds uh, mental illness. It's funny because if I had broken my leg or had cancer or something else that caused me to become hospitalized or had to go to emergency, I would tell everybody, but this is the first time I'm really telling anyone about what happened. Uh, there's a few close friends who know about this, but I really haven't told very many people. So now everybody knows, but I hope that that does more good than harm. Um, time is our most precious resource, and when you spend a little bit of your time with me, I really appreciate it. I hope wherever in the world you are, that you're well, that you're healthy, and most importantly, that you're happy. Uh, I would like to encourage you to subscribe, like, comment down below, and activate the notification bell. That's it from me for today. Take care. Bye-bye.